So, on this Shabbat, we are at one of the lushest, thickest Torah portions. What that means is there's a lot in this Torah portion. It's like a forest. Come get your copies. Um, there's a lot in this Torah portion. Now, uh, thank you. Big G was telling me that his family was reading the Torah portion, mm -hmm. and they got so confused. With this Torah portion, that's typical, because there are hun literally hundreds of pictures in this Torah portion. This is a big teaching because there's so much in this Torah portion, but I pared it down to four big pictures. And even four big pictures, I could speak for hours and hours and hours. So I had to really limit this. So this Torah portion, Vayechi, is from Genesis 47. Let's go there. We're going to read a lot of verses, a lot of passages. Oh, can somebody get my old man glasses from the, uh, from the box for me? And Vayechi means, and he lived. And even just the name of the Torah portion is a big thing. And this will help, hopefully, to clear up your confusion about it keeps flip-flopping back and forth in this Torah portion between the name Jacob and Israel. Please pay attention. It flip-flops back and forth between Jacob and Israel. Yours, I It's not there? No, it's probably in the car. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, because there's two natures of man. There's a spiritual nature and the physical nature. And at the end of his life, Jacob keeps flip-flopping back and forth between spirit and soul, spirit and flesh. He's a good guy, and then he's a bad guy. He's a good guy, and he's a bad guy. Back and forth. When he does the pictures, he is... Who do you think? Israel. Israel. He's the spirit, right? Spiritual man. When he's not doing the pictures, he is Jacob. Flesh. Flesh, right. His old nature. Let's just call it his old nature. So, Genesis chapter 47. And he lived. Now, I've broken it down into the different pictures. There's two pages of them. The first page and the second page. And I've broken it down into sections. These are the pictures we're going to look at. Jacob lived, the name of the Torah portion, the vow to Israel, the vow that was made to Israel, the blessing of Manasseh and Ephraim, and then the blessing of the 12 sons of Israel. And that's all we're going to look at, and it's going to take an hour and a half, probably. So, let's look at the first one. Jacob lived, 47, 28. So it starts out by saying, and Jacob lived in the land of Egypt. So is he, I'll just call it good guy or bad guy, just to keep it simple. Is he the good guy or the bad guy? Good. Bad. Flesh. Bad. I said good guy or bad guy? Bad. bad. Bad guy. So the bad guy lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. But look at the verse before. Look what it says. <laughs> now Israel lived. Isn't that strange? One verse right after the other. And Israel lived, and Jacob lived. So just knowing what we know about Israel and Jacob, that Israel's a good guy and Jacob's a bad guy, so to speak, knowing that, do you think that the verse prior, verse 27, do you think it uses the same words in Hebrew, and Israel lived? In the land of Egypt? Do you think that's what it says? No. Verse 27. And Israel lived in the land of Egypt. Verse 28. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt. Why would it repeat it with, his, with both of his names and repeat it in the same way? It makes no sense whatsoever. So, do you think verse 27 uses the word Vayahi, the name of the Torah portion? No. Vayahi. And he lived. And Israel, the good guy, lived in Egypt. Does that make sense? Yeah. It does? Egypt is bad. Isn't it? Yeah. It's the bad place. That's where we're, you know, we become slaves. It's not good. Vayechi, <coughs> and he lived, is Jacob. It's not the good guy, it's the bad guy. 
So just knowing what we know, that Israel's the good guy, Jacob's a bad guy, and the bad guy lived in Egypt, the verse prior, do you think it says lived? Do you think it uses the same word? Vayachi. Mine does it. Mine says dwelt. Okay. That's good translation, dwelt. It's the word dwelt. That means temporary. He dwelt temporarily in Egypt. Who dwelt temporarily in Egypt? Israel. Israel, the good guy. But the bad guy lived there. He put down roots. He planted himself in the world. And he felt comfortable in the world. That is not good. And how long did he feel comfortable in the world? 17, no, 17 years. In verse uh, 18, it says that he was comfortably living, sorry, in verse 28, comfortably living in Egypt. That ain't good. But it's the bad guy. So you can see why he felt comfortable in Egypt. The verse prior is not the name of the Torah portion. The verse prior says, Vesheva Yaakov. Sorry, Vesheva Yisrael. And Israel dwelt temporarily in the land of Egypt. That's not the name of the Torah portion. So this Torah portion starts out with Jacob, the bad guy, living in Egypt, and he shouldn't. So here's what we have to see. We have to see a flip. Do you understand what I'm saying? We've got to see a flip. The verse prior, you know, the very last verse of the last Torah portion ends with talking about the good guy, Israel. And he's temporarily in Egypt. That's good. Fantastic. But the very next verse says he flips into Jacob, and now he's comfortable in Egypt, living there. So something has to change. And the reason it has to change is because there's four big giant prophecies in this. There's actually more than that, but there's four big giant prophecies that we're going to look at in this Torah portion. They're huge. Three of them, them changed the whole world. That cannot come out of the mouth of Jacob. Let me say it this way. Talking about the coming of Yeshua, is that going to come out of the mouth of a Rastafarian? Probably not. No. It has to come out of the mouth of somebody who's spiritual. So Jacob's got to change in order to make these prophecies, and that's what happens. But it starts out with him as Jacob. Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years, so the length of Jacob's life was 147 years. He's bad. Something's got to change. All right, next passage is uh, 29 to 31. When the time for Israel to die drew near, the time for who to die? Israel. The time for who to die? Israel. Right, so he's changed. Now it's Israel. The time for Israel to die near, uh, die drew near. So now he's going to prophesy about what everybody wants to know about. All the church, all the Christians want to know about. What do they want to know about? What does everybody want to know about? When's Jesus coming? Right, the day of the Lord. When's Jesus coming? Right. The reason they want to know is because number one, they don't know what the day of the Lord is. Right. They think it's the coming of Jesus. And number two, they don't know what the birth pangs is. They think it's tribulation. And number three, they don't know when any of it is. So this is what everybody's all excited to know. This is what he's going to prophesy about. Plus they think they all get to go to heaven then. Right. So Israel is going to prophesy about end time things. Have you heard the word eschatology? No. Eschatology is a theological word theological word that means end time things. Eschatology means end time, end time things. So he's going to make eschatological prophecies. So the first one is this. First thing we're going to look at is this, the vow to Israel. When the time for Israel to die drew near, he called his son Yosef and said to him, Please place now your hand under my thigh and deal with me in kindness and faithfulness when I lie down with my fathers. Carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place, which was in 
Machpelah in Hebron. Hebron, Hebron, in south Israel. And he said, I will do as you have said. And he said, swear to me. So he swore to him. Then Israel bowed at the head of the bed, whatever that means. And we're going to look at that. Now the next one is the blessing of Manasseh and Ephraim. Manasseh and Ephraim, which is in uh, 48, 2 through 16. When it was told to Jacob, now, is he a good guy or a bad guy? All right, so the bad guy, the man of the flesh who, who lives fine in Egypt, it was told to him, Joseph has come. And look what the very next thing says. Israel collected his strength. So Jacob, the bad guy, hears that his son is coming, and he's dying. He knows he's dying, so he better do something. So he immediately he changes, and he becomes Israel. He collects his strength, and he says, all right, all right, I got to do this right. And he starts prophesying about end time things through Manasseh and Ephraim, the sons of Yosef. Israel collected his strength. And ja now he's back to Jacob. And Jacob said to Joseph, your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine. Now, he's, he keeps flip-flopping back and forth. And the question that at least one person had is, it's confusing. Why does he keep flip-flopping back and forth? Well, he's got his son and his grandchildren there. And look what he says as the bad guy. He looks at his grandkids and he says, Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine. And then it says, the eyes of Israel were so dim from age he couldn't see. So now he's back to Israel and he's blind. Now, can any of you think of a passage that, that says this? Isaac. Nope, nope. About Israel. Israel, not Jacob. Israel being blind. There's none so blind as my servant. Very good. It's in Isaiah 43, I think. And it says, who is as blind as my servant Israel? Who can see? And then it starts talking about the future. This is a, it, it comes from this. Isaiah saw that for the future in this passage here, where he's Jacob, and then he flip-flops back to Israel, back to Jacob, back to Israel, and when he's as Israel, he's blind, and Israel said, you know, God told me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and cause you to multiply, and I will make you into a congregation of peoples. I talked about this a couple of weeks ago. A congregation of peoples. And I will give this land to your seed after you for an everlasting inheritance. Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, crossing his hands. Good guy or bad guy? Crossing his hands. Oh, good. No, good guy. Good. Only good guy. It was Israel who reached out and crossed his hands. So he's flip-flopped back to Israel. He's making the blessing properly as a spiritual person. Stretches out his right hand, laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, crossing his hands. And he blessed Joseph and said, uh, Bless the boys, and may my name... Which name? Israel. 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 Not Jacob, Israel. May my name Israel live on in them. And the names of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and may they grow abundant like fish in the midst of the earth, is what it says in Hebrew. Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on Ephraim's head, and he grasped his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. His father refused and said, He also will be great. However, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed will become a multitude of Gentiles. All right, and then the last thing, the last big end time prophecy we're going to look at is 49, uh, 1 through 33, basically the chapter 49, which is when he blesses the 12 sons. There is so much in this, it's ridiculous. So we're just going to look at three of them. We're going to only look at Judah, Dan, and Joseph, and that's it, because there's so much. Jacob summoned his sons and said, I will tell you what will befall you in the latter days. This is in the day of the Lord. So he is, 
Who summoned his sons? Jacob. Jacob called his sons and said, I will tell you what will befall you in the latter days. Now, this is strange. This is the bad guy, right? But he's prophesying about the day of the Lord. So here's, here's what the rabbis get from this, you know, this flip-flopping back and forth. There are many scriptures where God in the prophets talks to Israel and calls him Jacob. And it's always in the day of the Lord. Always. And Israel was spiritual and he saw the day of the Lord. But then when his 12 sons are in the day of the Lord, who is he? He's both. He's Jacob and Israel. He's both. That's why he switches in the day of the Lord only. In the day of the Lord only. So, that's why here it's Jacob speaking about things about the day of the Lord. I will tell you what will befall you in the latter days. The Aharit Yamim. Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. Now this is in the kingdom, in the day of the Lord. The scepter will not depart from Judah or the ruler's staff until Shiloh comes. He washes his garments in white and his robes in the blood of grapes. And then to Dan... It says, Dan shall judge his people. Dan shall be a serpent in the derech. <clears throat> now, I want you to look, if you have your Bible, look at Genesis 49, verse 2. He gathers his, his sons as Jacob. Yes? Yes. But the rabbis say that in the kingdom, he's both Jacob and Israel. Because God named him Jacob. And he's the seed of God. He carried the seed of God. So in the kingdom, he can be Jacob, and he's not a jerk. Look at verse 2. Gather together and hear, O sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel, your father. He's both. So when these prophecies are given to Judah, Dan, and Joseph, it's not just Israel speaking. It's Israel and Joseph. Sorry, and Jacob in the day of the Lord. Yes. But right there it's um, assemble yourselves and listen, sons of Jacob. Sons of so Jacob. It's like the sons of my flesh. I'm going to speak to you in the spirit. Yes, but who summoned them? Who called them? Jacob. Jacob. He called them to hear the prophecy. So don't get don't get freaked out that in this prophecy he's both Israel and Jacob. It's okay. As long as it's in the day of the Lord. But only in the day of the Lord. Okay, so Joseph. Joseph is a fruitful... I'm sorry, I've got to finish Dan. Dan shall judge his people. Dan shall be a serpent in the derech, a horned snake in the path that bites the horse's heels so that his rider falls backward. And then to Joseph. Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a spring. His branches run over a wall. The Almighty who blesses you with blessings of heaven above Blessings of your father have surpassed the blessings of my fathers on the head of Joseph, on the one distinguished among his brothers. When Jacob finished commanding, is what it says in Hebrew, if you believe in commandments. It'll say most versions charged. But it says seva in Hebrew. So if you believe that there are commandments, this would be commanding. And all he did was prophesy about the future so it cannot be commanding when Jacob finished speaking to his sons he drew his feet into the bed and breathed his laugh last and was gathered to his people all right so let's go back to the beginning Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years good guy or bad guy bad guy so the length of Jacob's life was 147 years now, in Hebrews 11, 13 through 16, they call this the, what do they call it? The faith chapter, right? You've heard that? The faith chapter. Hebrews 11 is a, a listing of the fathers and things they did in faith. One of them is being born. Who was born in faith? Come on, Christians, you who know Hebrews 11. 
Who was born in faith? You don't know? Who was hidden at the age of three months in faith? In faith. Moses. It says Moses by faith. He was born and was hidden for three, three months. Weird, huh? Well, this is just as strange. So in uh, 13 through 16, it talks about Shava, Sheva, to dwell, and Hayai, to live. Who lived in Egypt comfortably? Jacob. 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 Who dwelt temporarily in Egypt? Israel. Israel. Well, that's what it says here in, in Hebrews 11, 13. All these, all these people that it listed, died in faith. Do, do you understand what that means? Their death was in picture form. Faith is understanding, yes? Yeah, yeah. How do we get faith? By studying. <laughs> by looking. By listening. You listen to the mitzvah. It talks to you. Yeah. You get faith. Yes? yes? So by hearing and by seeing a picture, we get faith. This says they died like that. Do you understand what it's saying? It's, it doesn't mean they died hoping against hope that one thing will come. That's not what it means. It means their death was a picture that taught them. And so they then spoke to their children with that understanding. That's what these prophecies are in Genesis. They're spoken prophecies while this man is dying. Didn't it say he was dying? For all three. When he calls his son Yosef, it says he called him why? Because he knew he was dying, yes? yes? He blessed Ephraim and Manasseh, why? Because he was dying, yes? yes? He called his 12 sons to prophesy to them because he was dying, yes? yes. That's when he spoke in faith. That's what it's saying here. It's not saying, oh, I have faith. I shall come to my grave in faith. That is absurd. What it's saying is their words were words of understanding because they died in faith. They died with understanding. And that's what it goes on to talk about. Um, all these died in understanding without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance. They're going to be way in the future, but I'm, I'm welcoming it now. And having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. How did Jacob say he was a stranger and an exile on the earth? I'm sorry, how did Israel say he was a stranger and an exile on the earth? Because he dwelt. Right, because he dwelt. He didn't live. Yes? He says, hey, guys, I'm, I'm here temporarily. This isn't my home. That's my home. I've seen it. For those who say stuff like this make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of the country that they came out of, they would have had opportunity to go back to that thing. But as it is, they desire a better, that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be their God because he has prepared a city for them. Yes? Yes. All right, so all these prophecies that Jacob slash Israel made, he made in what? Faith. In faith. He made in faith because he understood. And he was dying when he did it. Not like, I'm coming to my death. Dying. In the process of dying. Now I want you to think about this. When people die, and most of us have seen people die, they get weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker and then <sighs> done. Yes? yes? This is just the opposite. Remember, he was in his bed as Jacob and he called his sons. And then what did he do? He sat up. Right, he sat up and he gathered his strength. He's dying. And so he went from Jacob 
Oh, God, I can't wait to get out of here. Oh, well, you know what? I see something weird from God. I better tell the kids. I'm going to tell them. And he gathers his strength, and he gets really strong to do this as he's dying. He didn't stand. He didn't stand. He never stood. He sat up in the bed, and it's very important that he never stood. He sat up in the bed, and then we're going to talk about this later. It's important that he didn't stand. All right. What does Jacob mean? Heel catcher. Yaakov, the heel, grabbing the heel. In other words, he comes at you from behind and gets you. He's a jerk. He's a thief. He'll find some way to manipulate you. He'll come up from behind. God wrestles with him. Who wins the wrestling match? Jacob. Jacob, right? Jacob won. And so because Jacob won the wrestling match with God, God says, you've wrestled with man and with God, and you won. And so I'm going to change your name to Israel, which we went through this couple, three weeks ago. Minister of God, Prince of God, Upright of God, or Leader, or Commander of God. So it means strong. It means something really, really strong with God. That's what he had to do in order to make these prophecies. He had to go from the nature of the lazy, manipulator, whatever, guy who comes up from behind, I just want to make my way through this world, man, this ain't my world, I'm just trying to make my way through it. I think I'll, you know, spit on your window and clean it for you. Give me a dollar. Goes from that to, I've seen that. Dad, you're dying. You better slow down. I've seen it. Let me tell you what's going to happen in the day of the Lord. Then he dies. Now that's a huge change. All right. Genesis 47, 28. Again. Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years, so the length of Jacob's life was 147 years. Now here's what Rashi says about and Jacob lived. Who's Jacob? Good guy or bad guy? And he lived comfortably. That's not good. Rashi says this. Why is this section closed? That's what he talks about. Why is this section, and Jacob lived, closed? Now, you guys probably don't know what a closed Torah portion is, do you? Do you? Does anybody know what that is? No. Okay, let me show you. This is a closed Torah portion. This is a bunch of Torah portions that are open, regular. Most Torah portions, actually, all Torah portions are open, except one, this one. See how it starts right in the middle of the, of the block of letters? You can't even see where the Torah portion starts. Yes? It's hidden. It's concealed. You have to go hunting around to find it. The other Torah portions, like this, there's a big break between. Like this, there's a break at the end of the line. New Torah portion starts cleanly here. This one's got a break in the middle of the line, but then it starts cleanly at the end of the break. Same thing here. So there's always a clean break at the beginning and end of a Torah portion, but not this one. This one is buried in the midst of the Torah portion. You gotta go find it. You have to hunt for it. So Rashi says, why? Why is it like that? Look what he says. The eyes and heart of Israel were closed. In other words, it became dark for them. Meaning the Egyptians immediately commenced to subjugate them as soon as Jacob died. Right when he died, Egypt immediately brought darkness to their life. While Israel was alive, they were okay. But the second he died, darkness fell on the Jews in Israel, in, in Egypt. For the Egyptians commenced to subjugate them. Another explanation is this, and this is the one I really like. He, Jacob, attempted to reveal the end, the end to his sons. Didn't it say Jacob spoke the prophecies? So he's right. Jacob attempted to reveal the end of, to his sons, but it was closed off. It was hidden. It was concealed. It says that in the Bible, doesn't it? 
In Daniel 12, talking about the end, say ketz. Say haketz. Ketz means end. Haketz means the end. Say haketz. Haketz. Now say ketz yamim. That means end of days. Yom is day, yamim, plural. End of days, ketz yamim. The ketz, haketz, means the day of the Lord. And Jacob, who is a fleshly man, tried to reveal to them the day of the Lord. You think that's going to work? It's concealed to him. Now, was Daniel a righteous man? Daniel, Daniel. Was he a righteous man? Yes. Well, it says in Jeremiah that even, even if Daniel, Job, and Jonah were to pray for this people, it wouldn't do any good. It, it, God picked the three most, the best, the best prayers, the guys who could pray the best in the Bible. Jacob, uh, sorry, <laughs> Job, Jonah, and Daniel. Even if these three guys prayed for Israel, it would do no good. I am bringing Babylon to kill them. So we know Daniel is an amazing spiritual man, yes? yes. God says to Daniel this. But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal up the book until the end, until the caps. Many will go back and forth and the knowledge will increase, but as for you, go your way to Haketz, then you will enter into rest and rise again for your allotted portion at the Ketz Yamin. Did Daniel understand all the stuff that he saw? Conceal these words and seal up the book. Did Daniel understand all these prophecies he yeah. saw? Yeah. Conceal these words and seal up the book until the day of the Lord, until the cats. Did Daniel understand all these prophecies? No. No. Yes, it's sealed up until the day of the Lord. Daniel didn't have the slightest idea what the heck he was saying. And he says that three or four times, by the way. And God says it. These words are concealed. Was Daniel righteous? No. Oh, for goodness sake. Was Daniel righteous? Yes. So to Daniel, a righteous man who couldn't see, same thing happened with Jacob. Same thing happened with Jacob. Jacob saw it, but he's like, what the heck is that about? He didn't understand it, either did. Exactly, I see it, but I don't know what it is. That's sealed prophecy. Seal it up until the, the cats. Now, Jacob had the same deal. He saw it, but he couldn't really explain it very well because he didn't really understand it. That's why the Torah portion is hidden. It's concealed. This Torah portion has more prophecies in it than any other Torah portion. But it's sealed. It's hidden. It's concealed. It's closed. It's closed. It's the only Torah portion that's closed. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So for Rashi to focus on this aspect of the Torah portion, he's pretty smart. This is important that it's closed and the only one that's closed. All right, so now let's talk about the first vow, the first big picture. When the time for Israel to die drew near, he called his son Yosef and said to him, please place now your hand under my thigh. Four weeks ago, I think it was, we talked, no, five weeks ago, we talked about this. When Eliezer had to make a vow to Abraham. And Abraham said, place your hand under my thigh and make a vow to me and swear to me by what? Swear to me by what? Eliezer, put your hand under my thigh and swear to me by what? By my seed. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. By my seed. By my seed that are in my testicles. My seed being the children that are going to come. Isaac, 
Jacob, the twelve sons, etc., the Jews, swear to me by my seed that you will take the right woman to produce these children. Yes? Remember yes. that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, Jacob now, 140 years old. Is that how old he was when he died? 147. 147 year old man says, grab a hold of my testicles and swear to me by my seed at 147 and I'm on my deathbed. What's going to happen with that seed? It's going to die. And yet he says, swear to me by my seed. So obviously it ain't going to die. It goes on forever. The seed of Israel goes on forever. Please place now your hand under my thigh and deal with me in kindness and faithfulness. When I lie down with my fathers, carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place. And he said, I will do as you have said. And he said, no, swear to me. So he swore to him. Then Israel bowed at the head of the bed. This is in Hebrews 11. He bowed at the head of the bed. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. It's not a small thing. Now Rashi says about under my thigh, since one who swears must take with his hand an article related to a mitzvah, such as a Torah scroll or tefillin, and circumcision was his first mitzvah, this is talking about Abraham, he had, and he had fulfilled it with pain, it was important to him, so he took it. In other words, Abraham took his circumcision in hand, gave it to Eliezer, who made the oath. Same thing happened here. And in the, in the Rashi commentary, Rashi says, see my note, when Abraham did it with Eliezer. And so this is the same uh, act. Joseph took the circumcision of who? Joseph took the circumcision of who in hand? Of Israel. So he, he's, he's getting the seed of Israel. And he's swearing, I'm going to bury you in the right place. Not in Egypt, in Israel. In other words, we're going to Israel. Now it doesn't happen for another 300 or so years. But it does happen. Not 430 another 300 or so. Okay, and that's in Genesis 24, 2 and 9 about Eliezer and Abraham. Now in Hebrews 11, like I said, it talks about this. Verse 21, by faith, Jacob, as he was dying, by faith, who? Jacob, Jacob. man of flesh or man of, sin, or, or man of spirit? Man of flesh. By faith, the man of flesh, Weird, huh? Only in the kingdom. Only in the kingdom. By faith, the man of flesh, as he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. Now, what it says in the Torah portion is he, he gathered his strength, he sat up in the bed, and he prophesied. And then it says he pulled his feet up in the bed and he died. So he's sitting on the edge of the bed, leaning on his staff, maybe, maybe. But in the Torah portion, in, in my version, in most of your versions, it says, at the head of his bed. Is, is your say that back in, yeah. in uh, Genesis 47, 31? Swear to me. So he swore to him. Then Israel bowed at the head of the bed. In Hebrews 11, it says, on the top of the staff. Okay, this is important. It says in Hebrew, you can see it here, Vayishtachu Yisrael al Rosh Hamita. Hamita. Now the word for bed is Mita, but the word for staff is Mate, and it's written exactly the same. So is it Mita or Mate? Is it his staff or his bed? Oh, his bed. Yeah. It's both. What? 
This is the Bible we're talking about, guys. Is the right picture the bed or the staff? What's the right picture? All right, what's the staff in the Bible? What's it a picture of? What's the staff that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob had and Moses? What's the staff? Nobody? No, not authority. You don't know? The tribes. Yeah. There's a Torah portion called uh, Mitah, which is the, the rod of the tribes. It's just tribes, which is Mitah. Same word. Right. So it's the tribes. It's a picture of the tribes. When Moses put up that staff, he was raising Israel, and so God split the sea for Israel. When Abraham came to the promised land, he's got his staff with him. That's the seed. That's the promise of the tribes. When Isaac does the same thing, he's got his staff. It's a promise of the tribes. It's the seed of God. When Jacob finally shows up and has all the kids, he says, I went across this river with nothing but my staff, and now I'm two giant companies. Of what? People. People. Tribes. Yeah. Tribes. So the staff is a picture of the tribes of Israel, yes? yes? Now, what's his bed? Jacob or Israel's bed in this prophecy, what's his bed a picture of? Rest. Rest where? In the day right. In the kingdom. In the kingdom. So we could read it, and I believe this is here on purpose, that in the Torah portion it's, it's bed, and in the New Testament, in, in Hebrews, it's staff. I think this is on purpose because they're both right. Vayishtachu, and he leaned, Yisrael, Israel, al rosh on the head, hamite, or hamate. He leaned on the head of his bed. His bed is rest. He's about to be gathered to the, to the kingdom, to his fathers. Yeah? What's the head of the kingdom? What's the head? Say it again. Yeshua. Yeshua is the head of the kingdom, isn't he? The king of the kingdom? What's the head of the staff? The head of the tribes? Yeshua. So this is my opinion. You can believe me or not. I believe it's here with two different words on purpose. They're both correct. He leaned on the head of his bed or he leaned on his staff. But either way, he's leaning on Yeshua in the kingdom. And so he's talking about, to his children, about the kingdom. And he's telling them what's going to happen in the kingdom. Does that make sense? Now when he's doing this, uh, we have to go back to the prophecy. He's doing the prophecy to Ephraim and Manasseh. <clears throat> Different prophecies. Not a, he's not on his deathbed. He's on his bed. But he does something weird. He crosses his hands. Yeah? And his son, Yosef, says, No, don't do that. What are you doing? And Israel says, No, it's okay. That one's going to be big too. But this one is bigger. Don't worry about it. I'm doing the right thing. So in this prophecy, Genesis 48, 3 through 4, See, Israel said, and he said to me, Behold, I will make you, God will make you fruitful and Cause you to multiply, Israel. God said this to me at Bethel. And I will make you into a congregation of peoples. We talked about this a few weeks ago. Congregation. Jacob, Israel, I will make you into a church of peoples. Yes. Yes. Remember, it's the word kahal. Kahal, congregation, which in the New Testament, they badly translate as church. Right? Yeah, badly translated, but it's the same concept. This is the body of Messiah. So now I have to talk about something that I have never spoken about, ever. I've avoided it like the plague. And the reason is, it's complicated. And Christians can't handle it. Christians can't handle complicated. Messianic Jews can't handle complicated. A few people, a few believers can handle complicated, but very, very, very few. Back in the late 80s and early 90s, a false doctrine spread throughout the body of Messiah. 
The problem with this false doctrine is it's true. But it is demonic. It's very complicated because part of it is very true and part of it is not. And so they mush it all together and say, isn't that beautiful? It is not beautiful. Part of it is beautiful. Part of it is very, very disgusting and dangerous. Disgusting and dangerous. It's called the two house theory. That in the day of the Lord, oh sorry, that before the day of the Lord, all of Israel is going to be regathered to Judah. That Judah is the Jews and all of Israel is, guess who? Church. The church, Christians. That is replacement theology at its best. British Israelism, which was developed in the 17 and 1800s, but it's true. But it's not true. He tells Israel, I'm going to make you into a what? Congregation of peoples, a kahal, a church. It is the body of Messiah, partly. And here's where everybody loses their mind. Of all those people that are being regathered as Israel, very few of them are Gentiles, <coughs> but a few of them are Gentiles. The rest are Jews, but some of them are Gentiles. And some of them are from Gad and Asher and Naphtali and so, and the other tribes. And so this has developed into Christians saying, what tribe are you from? And they're serious about it. And they do all the research. Oh, I must be from the tribe of whatever because I'm like this. It's the stupidest thing that has ever come into the body of Messiah. Because it's replacement theology on steroids. But sometimes it's true. I knew a, a guy who was in our, our past congregation who was as Gentile as they come. But... He was praying about who he was, and it just, it just kind of came to the surface. All these attributes in the Bible about Benjamin. One of them was they could throw a rock and not miss a hair. It says that in Judges. You know, sling, they could, with a sling, you know, they could throw a rock and not miss a hair. And they were all left-handed. No, they were left-handed. They were left-handed. Well, this guy, he, he, he was that to the max. And then there were other things from Benjamin that he was. And so for, in that particular case, we were thinking, you're probably from the tribe of Benjamin, and you don't know it. But it's very, very seldom that this is true very seldom and so people mush this together and they go Ephraim is Israel Israel is the church the church is us we're Israel and then there's Judah the Jews now ah, we'll be rejoined with them very very damaging so this is the picture I did for the TLV Bible. Here's Ephraim and here's Manasseh. Nope, got it backwards. This is Ephraim and this is Manasseh. The right hand is the right hand of blessing and he crossed his hands and he put his right hand on Ephraim, the younger, and said he's going to get the blessing. And so Joseph it looks like an old Egyptian by this time, says, no, Father, what are you doing? Don't do that. <coughs> Uncross your hands. And, he's, and Israel, who sees without seeing, says, no, this is, this is the right way. And he blesses Ephraim. Now look at the blessing that God had given Jacob. Jacob. 
at Bethel, God said, at, at Jerusalem, God had said, God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, and may he make you into a congregation of Amin, peoples. Le Kahal Amin, a congregation of peoples. And now, the same thing is said to who? The same thing is said to who? To Joseph through Ephraim. To Joseph through Ephraim. You know, his children, Ephraim, the, the tribe of Ephraim is going to receive this same blessing. The blessing is, may God make you Israel into a congregation of peoples. And now, just little Ephraim becomes a congregation of peoples. So you could say, spiritually, that Ephraim is the church. Spiritually, but not in reality. Okay, are you with me so far? This one's complicated. Yeah, it is. It is. So he also will be great, he says. However, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed, the seed of Ephraim, Okay, now think about this. The seed of Ephraim, only Ephraim, will become a congregation of peoples. Then the congregations spring up of believers, and one says, you're from the tribe of, Eph of Gad. You're from the tribe of Benjamin. How is that Ephraim? How is that the tribe of Ephraim? It's a tribe of Gad, or Issachar, or Dan, or whatever. Does that make sense? He lost you. Okay, I'll say it again. Um, the subgroup of Israel, 12 tribes. God says, I'm going to make you, Israel, into a congregation of peoples, a church of peoples. And so there's 12 tribes. He takes one of those tribes and one kid from it, from that subset, and he says, that little subset, I'm going to turn into a congregation of peoples. Yes? So he has a bunch of kids, a whole bunch of kids, thousands and thousands of kids. And then the congregations of God spring up, the quote church, and one person from that church says to another person in that church, oh, you're from the tribe of Gad. Can't be, because you're from Ephraim. How did you become from Gad or Issachar or Zebulun? Or, see what I'm saying? It makes no sense at all. Does that help clear that up? Yeah. You've got to follow the subset. You can't just jump from subset to subset. Either you're from Ephraim or you're not from Ephraim. You can't be from Ephraim and be from Gad at the same time. Right? Okay. So the subset of the kids of Ephraim must be something other than the 12 tribes. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Here's the problem with that. Ephraim was northern Israel. <laughs> to throw another little kink in the theory, Ephraim was northern Israel. Southern Israel, when they split, who went with southern Israel? Judah and Benjamin, good, and? Uh-uh. Levi. Levi, and one other that nobody ever talks about, Simeon. Simeon's land was in the middle of Judah's, down in the desert. So these, these tribes went south. All the other were in the north, and they were called, especially in the book of Hoshea, Ephraim. Okay, Lower Israel was <laughs> Judah, Benjamin, Levi, and Simeon. And all the other ones were in Upper Judah. How many tribes are there total? Twelve. Twelve. Twelve, right. When they split, there was a picture acted out that I won't go into. Ten portions were given to the north, and two portions were given to the south. Not four, two. 
Judah, and anybody know who who the other tribe was? Levi. Is it Levi or is it Benjamin? Benjamin. So you can go look at it for yourself. It's with the guy named Jeroboam. <coughs> so that means there's they say ten lost tribes. Yes, the ten lost tribes of Israel. Yeah. No, they don't say the twelve are lost. They say the ten are lost. Ten lost tribes. But it's really not. It's eight. Because Simeon and Benjamin and Levi and Judah were together. Okay? Those lost tribes did not become Gentiles. They didn't become Gentiles. Gentiles, but they're called Ephraim, the northern tribes. They're called Ephraim. Wow, that is close. Okay, so this is why the Gentile, the church gets confused. They say, well, northern Israel is called Ephraim. That's the other tribes. So Ephraim can be Gad, and it can be Dan, and it can be Issachar. You see? Yes? No? Yeah. That's why it's confusing. All you got to do is follow the substance. All you got to do. God called the house of Israel, the house of Israel, when he included Judah. Not excluding Judah, talking about the north. He called the north the house of Israel. And then he included Judah and Benjamin. And he said, that's the house of Israel. Does it both ways. So it's not as clear cut as people who believe in the two house theory say it is. It's not. Let me say it this way. In Ezekiel, one of the very last prophets, Ezekiel's talking about Judah south and Israel north and he calls them all together the house of Israel got it Yeshua says I came only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel you see he came for the Gentiles no. that's what they say so it's not true he came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel what's well, the house of Israel it's all 12 tribes Always was. Okay, so in Genesis 17, 4 through 5, God is talking to Abraham, and he says, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, Abraham, and you will be a father to a multitude of what? Not peoples. Gentiles. Gentiles. Goyim. Multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Avram, but your name shall be called Avraham, because I've made you the father of a multitude of Gentiles. It is weird, isn't it? So from the very beginning, God begins to create a picture, a pattern, that Gentiles are part of Israel, the seed of Israel. From the very beginning. They're not separate. And we know this. We know this because of the big one that I've taught you and taught you and taught you in Amos chapter 9. God says, I will raise up the fallen sukkah of David and I will bring the remnant of Edom. Is Edom a good guy or a bad guy? Bad guy. I will bring the remnant of Edom, all the goyim, the nations that are called by my name. There they are, the father of nations, the father of a multitude of nations, multitude of nations, the going, the nations called by my name, the remnant of Edom. And then in Acts chapter 15, this is repeated by Jacob, James, and he says, he quotes Amos chapter 9, and then he says, taking from among the going, the Gentiles, a people for his name. Not taking only 
them, and that's it, to the exclusion of the Jews, he takes a few. A remnant. A few. A few stragglers. So th this is ridiculous to say the church, the Gentiles in the church, is really the gathering of Israel. It is not. It's one tiny, tiny part of it. Because it's a remnant of Gentiles. Only very few are added to the body of Israel. Very, very few. So, who is Ephraim? Who is Ephraim? Who do you think Ephraim is? Huh? The church? Congregation? Come on, keep guessing. Keep, keep trying. I want to hear what you think. Northern Israel? Who is Ephraim today? Let's say it that way. Who is Ephraim today? The answer is right here. I just went over it and you forgot already. Is this all Gentiles? A few added to Israel. So, I'm going to ask again. Who is Israel? I mean, sorry, who is Ephraim today? A few Gentiles added to the tribes of Israel, tribes, plural, of Israel. Because remember, the northern tribes were called what? Israel or Ephraim. The northern tribes were called Ephraim, especially in the book of Hosea, Hoshea. See how complicated this is? Now ch churches take this and kind of mull it down into a mush of pablum and say, here baby, take it. Isn't that wonderful? It is complicated. And you cannot keep it simple. You have to look at all of it. So, because of Amos and Acts, we know who Ephraim is. Ephraim is a few, a remnant of Gentiles added to Israel, Jews. Jews, Israel, northern Israel, that God is bringing back. Now, however you want to say that is fine, but that's who it is. Now let's look at the two sticks. Now that I have explained some of it, let's go to Ezekiel 37. You see why I've avoided this? Yeah. It is very complicated. And by the way, I've just taught the tip of the iceberg of it. This is just the beginning of it. And you see why I couldn't teach this until I taught you over a period of a couple of years, Amos chapter 9 and Acts 15, and what it means, the fallen sukkah of David, that's the linchpin. You cannot understand Ephraim unless you understand who Edom is, and the remnant of Gentiles, and the fallen sukkah of David, and God bringing them back. And that is justification in Acts for Gentiles getting saved in the first place. So until I taught you that, you couldn't understand the two sticks. All right, Ezekiel chapter 37. So he talks about the dry bones of Israel, all of Israel coming back to life. And then in verse 20, I'm sorry, in verse 15, uh, 16, Son of man, take... For yourself one stick and write on it Le Yehuda U Habne Israel for Judah and for the sons of Israel. And I'm sorry, for Judah and the sons of Israel, his brothers. On one stick, for Judah and Israel, his brothers. So remember, the kingdom was divided. You have the south, which is who? Judah. Who's the south? Judah. Judah. 
And the north is Ephraim, Ephraim or Israel. So one stick says for Judah, south, and for Israel, his brothers. Then take another stick and write on it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and all the house of Israel, his brothers. What one thing is in common with both sticks? And Israel. Israel, his brothers. Both sticks. They're not separate. You don't have the Jews and the Gentiles. That's not what this is. On both sticks is Israel and his brothers. They're both about Israel. Then join them for yourself, one to another, into one stick, that they may become one in your hand. And when the sons of your people speak, you say, what are you doing? What is this stuff about? Tell them, God said, I will take the stick of Yosef, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel. What is he holding? Stick, tribes. A, it's tri it's tribes. Okay, I heard stick and tribes. Perfect, perfect. What does mate mean? Tribes. Staff or? Tribes. Tribes. Right? So a staff is the tribes. So he's got two staffs and he puts them into one staff. Which is in the hand of Ephraim and the tribes of Israel, his brothers. And I will put them with it, with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, one mate, one, uh, one tribe, and they will be one in my hand. And the sticks on which you write will be in your hand in front of them. So say this, I will take the sons of Israel from among the Gentiles. Is he talking about south or north? north. Wrong both it's two sticks in his hand as one it's well, now one stick and he says here's what I'm gonna do I'm gonna take from both of these from the Gentiles the Jews are gonna come out from the Gentiles and the rest of Israel is gonna come out from the Gentiles and there's gonna be a few little stragglers remnant Gentiles that come with them sound familiar yeah. what what does that sound like the exodus from Egypt. right the exodus from Egypt <laughs> When Israel came out of Egypt, who came with them? A few of the, yeah, a few of the Gentiles. Right, same exact thing. It's, this is not weird. This is, we've seen this before. I will take the sons of Israel from among the Gentiles where they have gone, and I will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. The church was not promised the land of Israel, were they? Abraham and Isaac and Jacob were promised the land. Period. And I will make them one nation, one Gentile in the land, on the mountains of Israel. When is that going to be? In the kingdom, yeah. And one king will be king over all of them. When is that going to be? In the kingdom, when he is king. And they will no longer be two nations or two Gentiles. And they will no longer be divided into two kingdoms. And they will no longer defile themselves with their idols. I will deliver them from their dwelling places in which they've sinned and clean them up. And they'll be my people and I'll be their God. And David will be their king. David's dead. How can David be their king? Because it's not David. Who is it? It's Yeshua. It's the son of David. He's talking about the seed, but he's talking about the Messiah, son of David. David will be king over them, and they will all have one shepherd, and they will walk in my ordinances and keep my statutes and do them, observe them, and they'll live on the land that I gave to Jacob, my servant. Pretty cool, huh? So it's complicated. But if you can get your mind wrapped around this right here, it makes it 
pretty simple. Because you stop thinking of Judah as the little ones and start thinking of the Gentiles as the little ones, the remnant, the remnant, the few. Because in the church they think of, oh, of all the nations and all the peoples and all the tongues and all the tribes, then you got the Jews. But it's just the opposite. You get a few remnant Gentiles joined to this huge body of Israel. And it flips upright properly. Does that make sense? Yeah. This, this uh, remnant they're talking about, they identify the unclean spirit of the... Um, I don't know what you're saying. Uh, <laughs> I gotta go, I'm calling because I don't understand what you're saying. All right, Genesis 49. 19. I'm sorry, I just couldn't follow. Jacob summoned his sons and said, I will tell you what will befall you in the latter days. Say, acharit. It means latter or after. Yamim. Days. Acharit yamim. It means latter days is how it's translated. It means days that come after. The latter days are what? Day of the Lord. Day of the Lord. That's what it is. But it's plural. Days. So what do you think it is? Why does it say days plural? Because it's a, it's a thousand years long. It's many, 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 many days. Acharit yamim, the latter days. Now Rashi says on this, and Jacob lived. Another explanation, we're going to look at this again, that Jacob attempted to reveal the kets to his sons, but it was closed off, concealed. Remember that? So we're going to go back to that. Judah, I'm sorry, Jacob is prophesying, not Israel, but he's prophesying both Jacob and Israel at the same time. Remember in, in verse 2, it said, Jacob assembled his sons, and then he said, Jacob is prophesying, Israel is saying, or something like that. Yeah? It had both. So he's talking about the day of the Lord, doesn't really know what he's saying, and he says, we're only going to look at Judah, Dan, and Joseph. That's all we're going to look at. Genesis 49, 8 through 12, he prophesies about Judah. And he says, well, I have to read it. He says, the, the scepter, the scepter, the staff, will not leave Judah until Shiloh comes. Say Shiloh. Shiloh. It's not the same word as Shalom. Shiloh. It means tranquil, safe, or secure. Which is not the same word as Shalom, but it has a similar meaning. Shiloh. Until safe, secure, or tranquil comes. Now look what Rashi says about this. This refers to King Messiah. Rashi said this. And why did Rashi say this? Because there was a Targum that came right out and said it. Targum is like a paraphrase of the Bible in before the first century and in the first century. And in Targum, Onkelos, it says, this refers to King Messiah, to whom the kingdom belongs. And this is how Onkelos, who wrote the Targum, wrote it. Until the Messiah comes. Not until Shiloh comes. He just comes out and writes it. Until the Messiah comes. That's it, what it says in the Targum. To whom the kingdom belongs. This is bizarre. And it's amazing. If you were in the first century, you probably did not have a Torah scroll. Maybe you were writing one. Every family's, every Jew's supposed to write one. Maybe you were writing one. Maybe you had one, but it's doubtful. But you had a Targum available because they were very, very widespread. And you read, until the Messiah comes to whom the kingdom belongs. But we read, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff. What is this ruler's staff a picture of? tribes from between his feet meaning from his testicles his seed until the messiah comes 
to whom the kingdom belongs. This came out of whose mouth? Israel, Israel right, Jacob. Jacob said this to his son Judah, and it's going to be another 4,000 years until the kingdom. Isn't that a trip? Until the Messiah comes, and to, uh, to whom the kingdom belongs. So he's prophesying about the Messiah, but he also prophesies other things about the day of the Lord for Judah. He says in verse 9, uh, actually verse 8, Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. When? In the day of the Lord. Good. Your father's sons will bow down to you. When? In the day of the Lord. Judah is a lion's cub. When? In the day of the Lord. From the prey, my son. Don't, don't picture, what's his name? Simba. <laughs> don't picture that. This, this means a lion that just got finished eating. Picture a lion that just chewed up a carcass. Because it says, Judah is a lion's kid. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. You just finished eating. He couches. He lies down like a lion. And as a lion, who dares wake him up? When? In the day of the Lord. Verse 11. Now something different. He ties his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. Does this sound scary or peaceful? Peaceful. This is the peaceful part of the kingdom. 993 years of peace. He washes, now it, now it flips again. He washes his garments in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. Does that sound peaceful or scary? scary. This is Isaiah 63. Isaiah quotes this and then elaborates on it. And this is the coming of the Messiah during the birth pangs, at the end of the birth pangs. And it is graphic. 63. Isaiah 63. <laughs> who is this who comes from Edom with garments of glowing colors from Bozrah? This one who is majestic in his garment, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your garment red? It's my garments like the one who treads in the winepress. I have trodden the winepress alone. And from the peoples there was no man with me. I trod them in my anger. This is, you know, like in Revelation when it says that God treads out the wine and the blood comes up to the horse's bridle. That's quoting this. And trampled them in my wrath and their lifeblood is sprinkled all over my clothes. I stained all my raiment, for the day of vengeance was in my heart. Now that is quoting Jacob's words to Judah. It harkens back to Jacob's words to Judah. He washes his garments in wine and his robes in the blood of grapes. When does this happen? What part of the day of the Lord? What part of the day of the Lord? First seven years. What part of the first seven years, which is the birth pangs? I said it. The very last day of the birth pangs. Very last day of the birth pangs. His eyes are dull from wine and his teeth white from milk. Does this sound bad? Does this sound scary or peaceful? Sounds good. Now it's back to peace. So it's got peace, terror, and then back to peace. His eyes are red from wine and his teeth from milk. <laughs> all right, so in this passage to Judah is all details, all kinds of details about the kingdom. Not just one thing. Now, Dan, 49, 16 through 18. Hold just, just a second. Where is Israel or Jacob? When he's saying these words, where is he? In Egypt. In Egypt, okay. Where else is he? Tell me other locations where he is. On his bed. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> where, where else is he? Where else is he? Leaning on a staff. Leaning on a staff? Where else is he? Okay, now think less physical. Where is he? He's in the day of the Lord. And in, from the day of the Lord, he's like seeing it. He's there, he can see it. He talks about Dan. In the day of the Lord. Look what he says about Dan. Dan shall judge his people as if he is one of the tribes of Israel. It's, it, it sounds like, uh, well, is he or isn't he? It's, it's kind of fuzzy in the Hebrew. He's going to judge his people like he's part of Israel. But he might not be. Dan shall be a serpent in the dedech, in the way. Remember the believers were called the way in the first century. Does that sound good or bad? A serpent in the dedech. Is that good or bad? It's horrible. Horrible. A horned snake in the path. Let me say it this way. A serpent with horns. No bueno. No bueno is right. How many horns? Two. Two. Wrong. Seven. 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 How many horns in another passage? Ten. 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 How many horns in another passage? Eight. Seven and then another little, little one comes up. Or ten. Is this good or bad? Ten. Who is this horned serpent in the day of the Lord from where Jacob is talking. Who is the horned serpent? Who is the horned serpent in the day of the Lord? The false messiah. Right, the false messiah. The false messiah, I didn't hear you. Sound off. The false messiah. So Judah in the day of the Lord is the messiah. Dan in the day of the Lord is the false messiah. Who they call the Antichrist. Do you recognize the Antichrist as being the horned serpent? Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay. In the book of Revelation and in the book of Daniel, it talks about the false messiah, the, the quote, Antichrist. False messiah. In one passage it says he's a serpent in the water, and he's got seven horns, and another little one comes up. And it's the false messiah. And then in Revelation, two passages, it says a beast, a serpent comes up out of the water and he's got ten horns. And it's the false messiah. So Dan, in the day of the Lord, it's a little more complicated than this. So pay attention. He's the false messiah. But now there's another picture in this. It's also the church. In a good way, not in a bad way. In, yes, it is. In 1 Corinthians 5, sorry, in 2 Corinthians 5, it says, are you unable to form the smallest court to make judgments? Can't you form the smallest court in your congregation? Why are you going to a court in the world, in a, a Roman court? Don't you know that you will, what? Judge the nations. Not judge nations. But you're close. Nobody recognizes it? Judge Israel. No, not judge Israel. Judge angels. Oh, wow. Don't you know that you're going to judge the angels? Yeah, that's right. Right? <clears throat> the word for judge in Hebrew is what? Do you know? Dan. Dan. Dan means judge. Daniel means God is judge or judge of God. So this guy, Dan, his name means judge. So while he's a picture of the false messiah, he's also a picture of these strangers that will also judge along with Israel. Look at how it says it again. Dan will judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel, like he's one of the tribes of Israel, that's the Gentile believers. You get it? Yeah. They don't belong there. They're not 
They're not one of the tribes of Israel, but they're like one of the tribes of Israel. You see what I'm saying? Did you follow that? Because I'm not hearing much. Did you follow that or not? You have to say words, either yes or no. If it's no, then I'll help you. You didn't follow that? Okay. The word Dan means what? Judge. The tribe of Dan, we already saw is a picture of the false messiah, yes? The way it reads in the Bible is he will judge his people like one of the tribes of Israel. It makes him sound like he's not one of the tribes of Israel. But he's judging along like he's one of the tribes of Israel. That's the Gentile believers. Because Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, you Gentile believers, you're going to judge who? Angels. When? In the day of the Lord. So, you can't even comprise the smallest little court of Torah. You guys are going to judge angels in the kingdom. You better get with it. Like Israel will judge. So again, it's a remnant. It's a very small group of Gentiles that are going to do this in the kingdom. It's not a billion people. Well, it might be a billion. But it's not billions and billions of people like the church thinks. It's very few Gentiles that are going to join themselves to Israel in the kingdom. Very few. And that have joined themselves to Israel over the last 2,000 years. Very few. Did you get it that time? Okay, it's a little complicated because there's two overlapping pictures. All right, and then the last one. Joseph. Wait, look at me. Don't look at the... Wait, I'll get rid of it. So, if Judah is a picture of the Messiah in the kingdom, and Dan is a picture of the false Messiah in the kingdom, who do you think Joseph is a picture of in the kingdom? No, that's Judah. Israel. Think of what I taught you about Israel, and who Israel is, and who Ephraim is. Who is Ephraim now? Who is Ephraim now? Remnant of Gentiles along with Israel. Israel. Yes? That's who it is in the kingdom. It's the believers. It's the body of God, the body of Messiah. It's the same as it is now, only bigger. That's all. It just gets bigger. You found your place. That's exactly right. Exactly right, Pat. That's exactly right. It's so cool to be able to understand it. Isn't it? Not to just have it fuzzy and nebulous. It's so fantastic to know it clearly. So, uh, let's look at the prophecy to Joseph. Genesis 49, 22. Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a spring. Its branches run over wall. Does that sound good or scary? Good. Good. That's good. This is a good part of the kingdom. Archers have bitterly attacked him and shot at him and harassed him. Sound good or scary? That's so good. Okay, but look what he does when he gets harassed and attacked and shot him and harassed him. But his bow remained strong. His arms were agile from the hands of the mighty one of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. So this, in my opinion, is spiritual warfare. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's in the kingdom. It's Ephraim. We know who Ephraim is. He's being attacked in the kingdom, and he knows what to do. He knows how to take care of business. He knows how to shoot back. He's strong from the rock of Israel because he's tied into Judaism. He's tied into Judaism. He knows the Torah. He knows where he belongs. He knows how to fight, so he fights. So Ephraim is now, we'll just, I'll keep it super simple, the body of Messiah, which is Israel, and a bunch of Gentiles join with Israel. 
if Ephraim is the body of Messiah now, that's who it's going to be in the kingdom. Who are the only people on the planet that have the ability to do spiritual warfare? Who are the only people on the planet right now that have the ability to effectively wage spiritual warfare? Believers. Believers. And some Jews, but very few. Messianic Jews are believers. So only those who have the Messiah can do spiritual warfare properly, right? Right? They're doing it in the kingdom. They know how to fight. So I take this as it's just like now, only bigger. I don't think anything's going to change. I think it's just going to get bigger as far as, uh, you know, who Israel is, and how we fight and all that sort of thing. I think it's just going to get bigger and clearer. But I don't think anything's going to significantly change in how to, how to pray properly and how to do spiritual warfare. I don't think that's going to change. See why it's so important to know how to pray? Sure. As Jews pray? Yep. And not as the church prays? Yep. This is why it's important. Because it's going to be just like that, only bigger in the kingdom. Can't you constitute the smallest court of Torah? See what I'm saying? You're going to judge angels for God's sake. Right. You better figure this out now. You better think how to pray. You better figure out how to pray now because you're going to be fighting in the kingdom. All right. And then 25 through 27, 25 through 26. There's one word that's repeated over and over and over and over to Ephraim. From the God of your Father who helps you, for by the Almighty who blesses you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lie beneath, blessings of the breast and the womb, blessings of your Father have surpassed the blessings of my fathers up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. May they be on the head of Yosef and on the crown of the head of the one distinguished among his brothers. What word was repeated more than any other? Blessing. blessing. How do we get the blessing? Mm -hmm. How do we get the blessing? All right, let's back up. What is the blessing? Thank you, Pat. What is the blessing? Knowing God. Knowing God. How do we get that blessing? Listening to the mitzvot. Listening to the mitzvot. Doing Judaism. Listening to the mitzvot. You don't obey. You understand. You listen to, the, to Judaism. It talks to you. And you get to come to know God. This was God's plan to the, quote, church. That's Ephraim. That's Joseph. And God said, may that be heaped on you and heaped on you and heaped on you and heaped on you. When? When? In the kingdom. There's not going to be such a thing as a church and a steeple and a chapel and, a, and, and Catholics and priests and, and bishops and, I don't know, choirs and, and baptismal tanks and uh, communion and I don't know what else. Christmas, yeah, I always miss the obvious. And Easter, it's, it's gone. In the kingdom, it's gone. And the believers will be knowing God. But they can't know God unless they're doing Judaism in the kingdom. It was supposed to be the last 2,000 years, but it wasn't. But it will be in the kingdom. It absolutely will be in the kingdom. So you can go along for the ride or not. It's up to you. But if you don't go along for the ride, I'll pity the fool. <laughs> it's not going to be fun in the kingdom. 
You know why? You won't lose your salvation, but you will be forced, by force, to do Judaism, to hear God, to listen to Judaism, and to know God. You'll be forced to know God. You know how I know? Because King David did it. Guess who he did it to? Just think pictures. Who do you think he forced to do Judaism? You know the answer. Who did David force to do Judaism and to come to know God? Oh, come on. You know the picture. Oh, come on. Who is the remnant of Gentiles called by my name? The remnant of the Gentiles called by my name. Oh, my goodness. The fallen sukkah of David. Of David. The fallen sukkah of David. And I will call out a people from the Gentiles. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name. Who was it? The bad guys. Who was it? Oh, you know. Right, Edom. You got it right when I got to it. <laughs> Edom. The remnant of Edom. That's who David did this to. David forced, and I mean forced, you with a knife, you will do worship. Think about that. You will say the Amidah. No, your Hebrew's wrong. <laughs> now, you will listen to God. Open your ears. Get rid of that disgusting Gentile attitude and do it right. Because if you don't, you're going to lose your head. And some of them died. And I'm not kidding. This is how it was. And he was the perfect picture of the Messiah in the day of the Lord. And we, don't, we haven't done this in the last 2,000 years, but this is how it's going to be in the kingdom. So don't, don't go out and do that now, but <laughs> this is how it's going to be in the kingdom. Does this make sense? In between the Testaments, after the story of Hanukkah, the family of the Maccabees had a, one of them, Jonathan, who did the same thing. He forced Edom to convert to Judaism by the millions. And if they didn't, he wiped them out. A few of them came to know God. The rest were, were killed. A few of those trickled down and, and entered into marriage in, with the Maccabees and became, guess who? The Herods, who ended up murdering wow. Jews. So David had it right. David had it right. He didn't let anybody escape. If they didn't have a right heart, he didn't let them escape. And that's how it's going to be in the kingdom. People will be forced by force to know God. It's better to do it by our will. Don't you think? Okay, let's pray. But he did have to force the people Lord, thank you so much for taking people to the kingdom and showing the birth pangs and showing the coming of the Messiah and showing the false Messiah and showing the gathering of your people Israel and showing the gathering of a few Gentiles with your people Israel and showing us what it's going to be like in the kingdom and showing us the Messiah reigning in the kingdom and showing us the, the, the mountain of your kingdom swelling and filling the whole earth and showing us what to do and how to be and how to think to get to know you and to give us hope and understanding. And I ask, Father, that your spirit would teach your people in your body, the Gentile part of your body and the Jewish part of your body that acts more like Gentiles than they do Jews, how to know you through Judaism, through seeing through hearing and listening to your meets vote so that we can come to know you. And I know you're going to increase this in your body as the day of the Lord comes. I ask that your spirit would do it in this city and that your spirit would bring Gentiles and bring Jews 
who want to know you. That's my prayer, Lord. I want you to bring Jews and Gentiles who want to know you. I ask that you bring them by your spirit. Amen. Shabbat Shalom.